But if you understand liberty, if you understand that you have a right to your life and the fruits of your labor, this should bring us all together as long as we're not judgmental. Because if you legalize something, if you legalize personal behavior or religious beliefs, or intellectual pursuits, that doesn't mean we for a minute endorse what people do. We generally recognize this in religious behavior. People can have different religious beliefs. We don't put people in jail for that. And uh, also if people have no religious belief. So we sort of bring people together this way. But as soon as it comes to personal habits, as soon as it comes to spending your money, then we have these do-gooders that are on both sides of the aisle. They're do back and forth. And the job that we have as uh, promoters in this freedom movement is to bring people together, bring diverse people together and say, it's in all our interest to defend liberty and you get to decide how you want to use your liberty any way you want. Yourself, but you can't do things that will harm your neighbor, and that's a big difference. But when it is, when it is assumed that, that the government is there to protect you against yourself and against your own decision, that's when there's nothing left. And we're in that category right now. The government is so involved in everything that we do. That's why you have uh, DEA agents coming and arresting people and throwing them in prison and forgetting about it. But that's just one episode. Then this is happening all the time. This whole notion that these drug laws have to be enforced regardless. We have uh, a, a couple hundred of these operations, uh, these sting operations, these break-ins and SWAT teams, 200 a day. And I can rest, you can rest assured that it's not with proper search warrants and uh, proper conditions. But the whole idea that they're going to make things better it is the problem. But it's that violation that comes. And uh, the founders were pretty astute on about this. They didn't want a national police force. Yet even before 9-11, over 100,000 American uh, U.S. bureaucrats carried guns. The bureaucrats had to carry guns to enforce all these laws. Wow. So I think our problem is that um, we just have too many laws. <laughs> of the population and 25 percent of the prisoners so i would say well uh american people aren't any worse than the other country i think we just have too many laws and it's the repeal of laws that we that we have to uh, have to do we have to get rid of. The, uh, the drug war has been going on uh, for a good many years. Of course, in our early history, there were no drug laws, and uh, then they tried with alcohol. Just think about the alcohol. They actually had enough respect in that, those times that they knew they had to amend the Constitution to prohibit something. Today, you know, they don't even bother, so uh, uh, that's why our task is much greater. Uh, and, uh, and, and but we have to put this effort. But it is tied. It, it is all tied together. Individual liberty, personal economic liberty, as well as a foreign policy it comes together as us defending and understanding why we as individuals are important. Now we got off on a bad start in our early history. Obviously, the Constitution was a great document, but it was far from perfect because. Uh, there was obviously the endorsement of slavery and a lot of penalties because you belong to certain groups and that uh, to, to, to a large degree has been rectified. But we should look at this as nobody should ever be penalized because they belong to a group that they should never get any benefits because they belong to a group either. when we don't have hyphenated Americans. One little pet peeve of mine occurs on election night. You know, immediately after the election occurred, there's, there's always this analysis. They say, well, the Hispanics voted this way, the blacks voted this way, the Jewish people voted this way, the white Republicans voted this way. Why aren't we all individuals and not just part of a group? That's what we're saying. The 
what, what we need to do is bring the people together. And this is why I think the cause of liberty is so important, because we can bring people together. In Washington, uh, even today, you will hear, and we will be challenged, have to compromise. I say, no, you don't have to compromise. But what you should do is understand how to bring groups of people together because you endorse the same ideas. Because it is our campaign that has a tremendous outreach programs to people who are called independents, who don't belong to political parties, young people who are just looking at the political system, and, and, as well as many Democrats. Who knows, there may even be a couple Democrats here today. So. <laughs> So, no, I really do believe that the message of liberty can bring people together and that uh, it, is, it is the cause of liberty that, that does this. So this is, this is what we need to do rather than saying, well, okay, in the past, when we were a wealthy nation, we had a lot of largesse. And one of the disadvantages of a free society is, ironically, that there's so much wealth that people forget about emphasizing where wealth comes from. So then they gravitate to uh, sending more lobbyists to Washington rather than working more on R&D and, and producing products. No, they rush to Washington until the treasury is bare and that is what's happened today. So out of necessity, we are now being forced to think once again about production and where does wealth come from. Because right now we're broke and the treasury is there, and the money, although it's still functioning, will no longer function once people <clears throat> lose confidence on this. So there is something major going on, and this is very, very significant. The important thing is, the country is changing, and for the most part, I think much better. So I see the people like you who are rallying and saying, enough is enough, it's time we put our foot down and said, no more of this big government ruling our lives and policing the world and fighting wars that are undeclared and the printing press is running. It's time to change all that. revolution is a revolution in ideas, an intellectual revolution, and that was what preceded almost a hundred years before the, uh, the, our first revolution. So the groundwork has been laid. The intellectuals have studied economics and Austrian economics and sound money and the principles of liberty. We have a better understanding of monetary policy and economics than we, we did in the 19th century. So when they say we want to go backwards, it annoys me to no end. Because if we go back and pick up the pieces, really freedom is a new idea. A couple hundred years where it's been actually uh, tried. It is those who want more government and who will use bigger government if we have a deterioration of our economy as well as our political system. But they want to go back to more government. That's tyranny. Tyranny has been around for as long as history has been written. So we want to advance the cause of liberty, explain how free people act and take care of themselves and how you can live in peace under those conditions, much more so than with authoritarianism. There's no doubt the revolution is alive and well. It reminds me, uh, you know, of what's happening, what happened in the 1960s. I was drafted in 1962, and I was in the Air Force for five years. But I, I do remember, I do remember the turmoil that occurred in the 1960s, and there were some rough and tumble times there. And there was a saying that went that if you weren't a, a liberal, a bleeding heart liberal, when you were 20, that you had no heart. But if you weren't a conservative by the time you were 40, you didn't have a brain. But I, I don't know, why, why can't we have a heart and a brain at the same time? Because those people who are moved by humanitarian instincts of uh, force, using force to make you better people and, and to redistribute wealth, uh, the humanitarian, though, the one who really understands and who can care about the fellow man, I don't meet many people who say, I don't care about my fellow man. Most people do. 
But if you really do, you have to argue the case for freedom. You have to argue the case for sound money and limited government. This is what will help the maximum number of people. And I think that those ideas are alive and well, growing by leaps and bounds. And it is the alternative to endless growth of government and growth of spending. And we will not get out of this mess by spending more money and running up more debt. That will not work. Yeah. people wonder, you know, how well we're doing and how we will know about victory because sometimes we don't win the daily battles. Uh, sometimes elections uh, don't go exactly as we won. But in the 19, uh, by the early 1970s when that disaster, the Vietnam War finally ended, uh, two colonels got together, one American colonel, uh, Harry Summers, and uh, uh, Colonel Two, who was uh, Vietnamese, and they got together to talk over how they were going to pick up the pieces and how we were going to get out of their country, finally. So uh, they were talking about it, and our colonel, you know, still wanted to get the last word in, he says, listen, colonel, he says, yeah, I want you to know, you know, that you guys never beat us on the battlefield, not one time. And, and Colonel Two looked at the American Colonel and says, yes, but it was also irrelevant. <laughs> and that is the way it's going to be. We may have our ups and downs. We may uh, have victories here and there. We may lose a few. But eventually, we're going to win. And if you lose one battle, it's going to be irrelevant because the cause of liberty will be victors at the yeah. ultimate test if we continue to do what we're doing now and to increase this uh, revolution and spread this revolution throughout the land. Yeah. A, true, a true revolution has to have high goals and we have to we have to strive for what seems to be impossible because at times it just to be it just seems so overwhelming, you know. And and uh, you don't spend as much time in Washington as I do. So if you think it's overwhelming, you gotta go to Washington for a while. <laughs> a lot of friends will come up to me and say, How have you done this for all these years? Don't you get tired? Haven't you become uh, you, you know so disgusted with it all and discouraged? And I said, uh, no, not really. I said, uh, my, um, I, I, it never bothered me that much because I always guard, protected myself by not having overly high expectations. <laughs> and the victories have been always more than I had expected. Uh, but we do have to have high goals. And I am more energized now than I've been. I started really speaking out publicly when I was absolutely certain that I would never win an election because I thought I was, uh, you know, asking uh, for too much freedom, that sort of thing. But I started in 1974. And, uh, but but thing, things are... Of that nature cannot be stopped by politicians, governments, guns, and anything else. These ideas are very powerful. In the old days, they had to be spread by word of mouth. And if we can contain the government's attempt to overtake the internet, believe me, the internet will spread these messages. But in order to do this, you do have to have passion. There is no doubt about it. You would have to really feel strong about it and get involved. Educating oneself is very important to know and to understand why non-intervention foreign policy is a good policy, not a bad policy. We're not un-American and we're not against the truth because we don't endorse illegal wars. I mean, that, that is nonsense. And uh, one, one, I think, very good point for our campaign when they try to say, well, he doesn't support the troops, he doesn't support these wars. Yeah, but wonder why the troops support this campaign. That's right.